talk a little bit about what you see as a future of what you guys are doing. Uh, that's, that's a great question. So I'm going back to Paraguay in actually just about a week and a half. Um, and I'll be able to, I think it's just so much more easily, easy locally to see what's going on than trying to get updates remotely. So, um, so part of my answer for Paraguay, I think, will depend on what's going on right now with the deployment and finding out what's happening when I go down there. Because um, I haven't been down since 2010. Um, and I think the story is very individual. So there's a group in Peru, for example. I have a friend who is doing research down there. And um, the Peruvian deployment has been, you know, one that's, that's had a lot of problems. Um, and there's a lot of suspicion in local towns of, like, you know, Lima coming in and being kind of imperialistic, making everybody learn Spanish, give up kind of local languages, and a lot of the uh, popular resistance that is particularly prevalent in Peru. Um, Peru has a, has a long tradition of um, kind of protest and, and resistance of various sorts. Uh, but there was a group in Puno, um, gosh, what was it, a year ago or maybe two years ago now, that, uh, that said, well, these laptops are not being used much and Lima is not providing resources to follow up and to, to be able to use them. Um, they're not providing curriculum or anything that they, they said they would provide. Um, and we're somewhat uneasy about Lima providing this anyway. So we're going to take matters into our own hands, and we're going to translate the interfaces into the two local languages, Quechua and Amira, and we are going to start developing some local content. Um, so there's a group of, of uh, kind of hacker types, um, some of them from Lima, but you know, very, very in line with what's going on in Puno, who, who worked on this um, and who are sort of working on this on an ongoing basis. And, um, and I'm not sure to what extent the laptops are actually, you know, this content is actually being used in the schools at this point, because um, it's not my, my uh, primary focus. I'm, I'll be following up mostly with Paraguay. But, uh, but I see that as a really promising direction to go, you know, really something that's very locally grounded, um, grounded in local values, uh, very aware of the sorts of inequalities that can sneak in, because I'm, I think one worry I have is that it's very easy for projects like this to end up replicating and maybe even exacerbating existing inequalities. So, you know, haves versus have-nots. Um, one, one thing I saw in Paraguay was that a number of the kids who were most precocious with the laptops already had computers at home. And I mean, in Paraguay, that's 10% of the population in a general sense have computers at home. So these are, you know, these were the more wealthy kids. And it wasn't universal, but, um, but you know, I would hate for a project like this, which has so much promise to level these sorts of inequalities to only exacerbate them. And I think another thing I saw a little bit in Paraguay was that there were somewhat unequal resources given to boys versus girls. And there were a number of precocious girls, but it was the boys who ended up you know, going to Saturday hacker classes, for example. Um, and it wasn't that the girls weren't invited, but their mothers, when I asked them, said, oh, well, that's a boys thing. The girls don't go to that. And so you really have to push back on some of these, these cultural norms or, um, you know, kind of institutionalized inequalities to be able to get over them. Um, so I, I guess my answer is somewhat complicated. The future is uncertain. Um, I think there are some really promising directions, but, but they do need um, energy behind them and some resources behind them to really make them work. But I really hope that, uh, that that's the direction we go because that's a very exciting direction. Cool. And then what are some of the changes that you would say, like when you how the laptop has affected both the kids and the communities um, hmm. between the time you started and, and, and today? Um, so unfortunately, I didn't visit Paraguay before the laptops were out, but I did visit some of the nearby schools that didn't have, the kids didn't have laptops yet. The teachers had just received training. Um, so they, you know, and they were all aware of them. I'd visit them and they'd say, where are our laptops? We want to get on the internet. <laughs> um, but... Uh, just thinking about the sorts of things I saw. So one really interesting thing was that um, the rural kids around um, Kaukupe, which is the area that has the laptops in Paraguay, and the town center, the kids in the town center didn't have a lot of commonalities. The rural kids often, their parents were subsistence farmers, they'd sell things on the side of the road. The kids in the more urban area, their parents were often professionals or worked for the government or various things. Um, and the laptop gave them common ground. So one really nice thing I saw was that 
you know, they, they could just get together and work around the laptops in cases where they may not be able to talk to one another otherwise, or the rural kids would feel very shy about talking with them. Um, so I think that's one nice way that some of the inequalities between these two groups started to be erased a little bit. Um, I think some of the other changes I saw, there were certainly uh, more of a motivation to learn to read. So a lot of the rural kids in particular spoke Guarani at home, um, didn't have a lot of motivation to, to learn to read and write Spanish, which is the benchmark for passing third grade in Paraguay. And, um, but there's very little Guarani content on the internet. So those who were really kind of pulled in by, by looking things up on the internet had to develop their, their reading and writing abilities in Spanish a little bit more. And, um, and as a result, I heard at least, I didn't have statistics for this, unfortunately, I couldn't collect that, but I heard that more kids were passing out of third grade and continuing on with their education rather than getting held up. And some kids before would be held up, you know, a couple of years just because they really couldn't pass this final reading and writing Spanish test. Um, I also heard stories that kids were attending school more because that's the only place the internet is. Um, I, I would definitely even see kids sitting outside the schools on weekends. You know, they would be downloading. And, and a lot of it's just kind of, you know, what we would imagine, what, what we would call more leisure uses. They'd be downloading anime. They would be um, finding music that they like online. But I don't think it's... You know, I think leisure uses have their place as well. I mean, we all <laughs> do a lot of leisure activities on the computer. Um, and of course, the hope is that um, they'll eventually go beyond those sorts of things. But you know, it's, it's always a mix. Even the most precocious kids, they'd be doing some interesting things at home, often sort of encouraged by their parents who already had ideas about like, well, this is educational, this is not so educational, I don't want you using the computer like a television. Um, but then at school, they would, they would be very interested in media. So I think there's a place for both of those uses, just like there is a place for both of those uses when we use computers. Um, okay, anyway. Cool. <laughs> and then what kind of words of inspiration or words of wisdom would you have for people that wanted to, were thinking about volunteering? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say, word of wisdom. I would say go in with a really open mind and an open heart. Um, and this is, it sounds very trite, but I think it's very easy to go in with preconceptions about what is good and what is bad, or what we could provide. Um, and I think there is, there is a lot of, you know, these kids all had ideas about what laptops were, what computers were before, even before the exos arrived. Um, you know, they may not have a computer at home, but almost all of them would have television, they would have radio. This is something that is enough part of the part of popular culture that they were aware of what computers could could do um, and really respecting that and being open to hearing about about that um, I think is very beneficial rather than coming in with sort of preconceptions um, I think also just really observing carefully is is incredibly beneficial and I'm thinking in particular when I was so I spent six months doing field work in Paraguay, and during that time, Christoph Dürndorfer visited. He he runs the OLPC or helps run the OLPC news group, uh, news organization website, and um, he was incredibly good about just you know coming into a classroom with me or with other people and just sitting in the back um, and just watching what's going on. And I think that that kind of approach, that sort of humility and that openness, is incredibly useful for for seeing what's actually going on. Um, rather than, um, you know, kind of being at the front of the classroom and being introduced and then all the kids want to show off to you and the teachers want to show off to you. Um, so I would really encourage other volunteers to, to try to take that approach whenever they can. Um, and certainly when I first went down, the first couple weeks I was there, it was very much people wanted to introduce me and, and then everyone wanted to show off. And I was like, no, 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 just let me sit in the back. And it took a couple weeks for them to really be like, oh, she's, she's going to keep being here for a while, so we can, we can go back to our, <laughs> how we normally are. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as much as you can, to kind of getting that, that perspective from the back of the room rather than the front of the room is, I think, incredibly valuable. Cool. And then working on this project, I mean, it changed the kids. Would you say that it's changed your own outlooks, your own perspectives? Oh gosh, I'm sure it has. I'm not sure I can articulate exactly how. 
Um, I mean, it, it's been such a gradual process because I've been following the project for, again, for six years now. Um, I mean, so much of my own intellectual development is tied up with this project and with all of the different threads it touches. I mean, I, I came in, you know, not knowing much about education research. I know a lot more about education research now. I came in not knowing that much about um, transnational research or international development. I've had to read up a lot on that. Um, there are just so many different areas this project touches that um, it's, a, it's actually a wonderful opportunity to be, a, to be a polyglot, to learn about a lot of different areas. And, um, and really there's no end. I mean, you could, you could bring in all sorts of different kind of concerns in, the, in, the, uh, in engineering or in social sciences to this, and, um, and it's been a really exciting opportunity to have a project that is so rich like this, and to be able to look into so many different angles, and for it all to be very relevant to it. So, uh, so yeah, it's hard to pin down any particular things, but it's just been overall a very rich experience. Excellent.